today's episode of the Cryptoverse live stream. Here I have Mr. Bartek Grunewelski. Is that the way to pronounce it? Yes, perfect. From this Chief Operating Officer of Bitflyer. Is that right? That's right. Bitflyer USA. Bitflyer USA. So first question, how are you doing right now? I'm doing great. It's uh, 1230 p.m. in California and 65 degrees outside Fahrenheit. Well, you see, you say Fahrenheit and then I have no idea where you're talking about. Yeah, well, you yeah, know, America. <laughs> sure. So we've we've um, got this sort of interview together. So because you just mentioned something very, very specific there, which is Bitflyer USA, right? Mm -hmm. So people who are familiar with the crypto space would normally associate Bitflyer with Japan, right? Uh, so are you now branching out into the US market? Is that yeah, that's right. So you know, background on Bitflyer is that Bitflyer was based uh, or is uh, started in Tokyo in 2014 by two co-founders from Goldman Sachs. Um, they grew that into uh, what's become one of the largest virtual currency exchanges in the world. And in uh, late last year, the US office launched. Um, and then uh, actually in January, the European office launched. So we have a bit of a global strategy for expansion. Okay. But you know, Bitflyer in Japan is, is quite large. We're just getting started in the US and as well as in Europe. So, you know, it actually says it on your website, I think, the uh, the world's largest Bitcoin exchange has landed in the USA. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you measure largest? Yeah, the measure that we have there is through uh, volume. Um, and uh, that's obviously, um, you know, the vast majority of that is the Japanese volume. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why that's relevant is because one of the advantages of being able to be a global exchange is that you can link your order books together. So if you were just starting out in a new, as a new company uh, in the US or anywhere, you sort of start off with an order book that's just sort of siloed. Um, but the advantage of being a global company is that we can uh, pretty soon in the future start linking our order books together. So people in the US could be trading with people in Japan and all of a sudden you've got the depth of sort of a global market. How is that going to work though? Because if you've got, because every market is a pair, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like I was looking on uh, Coin Market Cap and looking at like the overall volume for Bitflyer, and at the minute it only lists like four markets, like Bitcoin against the yen, Ethereum against Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash against Bitcoin, and Bitcoin against the US dollar, right? Mm -hmm. So let, let's take the hypothetical situation where you're operating in Japan, America, and Europe, which would be mm -hmm. the yen, the dollar, and the euro, right? Right. So you're, you're obviously going to have a dollar, euro, and yen Bitcoin pair, right? And That's right. And so, somehow you can combine that volume somehow? Well, what you can do is you can actually uh, trade that pair that's not with your local currency. So, for example, someone in Japan could trade on our Bitcoin USD board. I see what you mean. Okay, I see what you mean. So, so like a really, a really simple example would be uh, you uh, sell, you, you transfer Bitcoin into our board, the USD board, as a, as a Japanese resident. And uh, then you sell some, and now you have US dollars. And now you can trade with both Bitcoin and, you know, uh, or, or Bitcoin on the USD board. I see. Because you're using your US dollar balance at Bitflyer. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you can just trade in and out of the dollar into Bitcoin, back to Japanese yen, and then from Bitcoin yeah. to the euro, and, and so on. Interesting. Yeah. Is, that, is that a nuanced thing for Bitflyer? Or do you do other exchanges do that? Is that something you guys came up with? Or are you just saying that's the benefit of being global? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if uh, we're exclusively the only uh, you know company that's figured that out. But that's the benefit of being associated with a really large company in Japan. Because if we were just doing it on our own, we'd have to like build the order books. Um, but once we link those order books together, all of a sudden Japanese residents can start trading Bitcoin with U.S. residents. Uh, in the U.S., we could um, uh, expose BTC JPY to U.S. residents and then have them trade on, you know, what's a very, very sort of active market in Japan. And then eventually Europe and the U.S. can trade together. So that's what makes it interesting. That is very interesting because the, the prices wouldn't get that far out of whack, would they, before someone closes the gap, right? Yeah, it's actually interesting because, as you know, there, there's uh, local price discrepancies, right, between the different uh, global um, virtual currency markets. And a lot of that has to do with um, um, movement of money and, and cash, you know, how locked in certain markets are. 
So um, I think I've uh, seen that like Venezuela trades really high, but that's because there's relatively difficult for outside capital to sort of get into those markets. Um, so when we start connecting the order books between Europe, US, and Japan, uh, local price differences, I expect I guess would probably start going down as, uh, as there's sort of like free capital moving between those different entities. You say the price would go down? Sorry, not down. Um, the the relative price difference between markets would go down. The price difference, yeah, that, that yeah, yeah, spread yeah, between yeah. one and another. I see. Interesting. Now, I suppose you could. That's like an arbitrage trade, which you could do right now, like between exchanges and do it manually. But you're saying right. just this this will be all within one, well, one one ecosystem, which will be Bitfly. And if you have a Bitfly account, I I could um, have my euro account and then trade it against the dollar and the Japanese yen. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And liquidity is like, the, the liquidity is an important thing for the volatility. That's two abilities in one go. But that's that's why crypto is so volatile, as far as I understand it right now, is just the lack of liquidity means that a some relatively small amount of capital makes the waves pretty serious, right? You know, yeah. So um so, I mean, Bitcoin is volatile as an asset class, sort of regardless of the exchange you're on, because it's so sensitive to people's um, perceptions of its value. But what makes um, uh, a currency within a specific board very volatile is the depth of the order book. So if you have a very shallow order book and someone places a large trade, all of a sudden that can um, move the market within your particular board. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of nobody wins in that scenario, right? Because if you're the person who's making that large trade, you're hoping to sort of get the price that you sort of see on the screen. And then you make a large trade, all of a sudden you're paying sort of like different prices at the end of your order than when you started out. Averages out. And yeah, yeah so the nice thing about having a, um, a deep order book is that you can make a particular, particularly large trade without really impacting the market. And that's mm -hmm. what, you know, m maybe people who are smaller traders don't really care too much. Um, but if you're, a larger trader or institution, um, we found that that's something that they actually care quite a lot about. Sure, it's funny. I had this discussion today actually. At what point does um, a trader go from an exchange to say like an over the counter thing? Because someone was asking me like, so there's essentially two markets. There's like an underground market, and then there's mm -hmm. the mainstream exchange market. Um, so why do why do people use and my answer to them was, why do, why do people use over the counter markets was similar to what you've just said. You can't guarantee if you wanted to sell or buy $100 million worth of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you wouldn't get it at the market rate. You'd have to find a counterparty willing to buy $100 right. million worth of Bitcoin. You agree a price via a broker, and then the deal is done, right? It just right. trades peer to peer, right? Um, so I suppose there is a threshold when you would just, just, just destroy the order book on a public exchange, you know? You yeah, know, no, exactly. Yeah. But so when, I think when, when you, you go. but yeah, so I think you're exactly right. When you have a particularly large order and you want to have certainty, then you go through an OTC desk and you find a private buyer or seller and you make the transaction. Right. I know this is kind of off topic, but you're a, you've got expertise in this area. So I'll, I'll ask you mm -hmm. those, those over the counter trades, how does that end up affecting the main, uh, a main exchange market? Because as long as there's trading behind the scenes, that's ultimately has to affect the main market, but only if they took some of that Bitcoin and started trading on the open market. I can't quite click, create the link there between mm -hmm. the over-the-counter volume and then the how that would impact the price positive or negative on the open market that we regular users use. Yeah, yeah so I think that the interesting thing about the OTC trading is that it's... Um, it's actively trying to not move the market, right? It's basically two people finding uh, and, and sort of agreeing on a, a certain price and then that yeah. price, uh, that transfer happens. Now you could argue that it, because it's part of the Bitcoin blockchain that you'd be able to see that transaction uh, on the blockchain. And from that, you could see that someone um, you know, purchased Bitcoin at a certain price at a high volume. And then that might drive the perception of where the market's moving, but it wouldn't, uh, necessarily be facilitated on a exchange, right? Where that mm -hmm. where that information is immediately visible, right? Like if we were on the Bitflyer exchange and someone placed a hundred BTC order, um, everyone would know that you know something just a lot of volume just happened. 
depending on how that OTC trade happens, if it, if it happens on exchange, it'll be visible. If it doesn't happen on an exchange, then it won't be visible, um, but it will s potentially still impact the price in some way as people like realize that 100 BTC had transferred from one wallet to another and you know they could speculate that that was a result of, um, of like an OTC trade. But it's a lot less uh, immediate in that sense. But you, you just made the point perfectly there, which is the whole point of an OTC market is not to move the price with a big buy or a sell. So thank you for that. That's filled in yeah. a knowledge gap for me there, right? Yeah. So, so you're the COO of Bitfire, which is Chief Operating Officer, and I assume that means you don't do surgery. <laughs> Sounds like it, Chief Operating Officer. So yeah. what do you, what, what's yeah. actually your role? What do you do day to day like? Yeah, so my job is to basically grow the US operations and uh, the US division of Bitflyer. So we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Bitflyer Japan. Um, and uh, Bitflyer Japan is like well established, has been there for now we're celebrating, we just celebrated our fourth year anniversary. Mm -hmm. Bitflyer in the US is a relatively new newcomer to the space. And you know, my role is to make it um, a dominant player in the um, exchange and sort of um, overall Bitcoin and virtual currency space in the United States. Okay, was that a long and difficult process to go from being a U uh, sorry a, a Japanese-based exchange to setting up a, a U.S. arm? Yeah, I mean the thing that we had going for us is that we had a very successful product in Japan. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you, you get a lot of um, value from having um, done a lot of the legwork on the engineering side, but every market is very different. Right. And right. so sure. the first thing that we had to do was to actually get the licensures in the U.S. to be able to operate. So unlike uh, Japan, where they have one regulator, it's called the FSA, um, the U.S. actually has a myriad of regulators. So we have state by state uh, regulators. We also have um, um, uh, sort of like general government bodies that are, you know, reg that regulate us depending on the type of coins that we have. So it's a lot more complicated in the U.S. And to um, to operate here, you really need to invest a lot of like work into your legal and like compliance infrastructure early on. So we started operating in November 2018, but we actually started working on it back in 2016. Sorry, uh, we launched in November 2017. But for a year and a half to two years before that, we were working and getting licenses, figuring out the structure, et cetera. Right. Got you. And you say here. So I assume you're in the U.S. right now. So I am. Yeah. You're not operating at Japan. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So we're headquartered in San Francisco, California. Okay. Sweet. Is that where you are now then? Yeah. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. So did you, did you come on into the company with that role or do you work at the Japan office and then come over or what, where's, what's your background before Bitflyer like? Yeah, so I came into uh, to it with this role, although uh, I joined when uh, we were you know, really, really small. Um, I had previously worked at a couple of fintech companies, one in the peer-to-peer -peer lending space, um, and then had been involved in, in financial technology for quite a while. And one of the fascinating things about Bitflyer is that um, it is a very sort of new industry relative to most things in financial technology. So financial finance actually is relatively slow moving um, and to innovate within finance is actually usually kind of difficult. Um, so what I had worked in was a company that did online lending and a peer to peer marketplace. And that was very innovative for financial technology, but it, you know, is still lending at the end of the day and mm -hmm. lending has been around for 3000 years and there's only so much you can do to sort of um, differentiate yourself from sort of the next lender. And the fascinating thing about the virtual currency space is that it's the exact opposite, right? The, the entire industry has only existed for eight years. Like we're on our eighth year after um, the white paper and it's still being formed. Like everything's changing uh, in front of our eyes. Even the um, last few months in the U S has, uh, you know, th things are changing. Like price is changing. Like uh, regulators are changing and um, you know, interest in different coins is changing. So, I found it to be a really exciting place to um, to switch from lending into. Sure. So once you'd established the U.S. company, um, was it like a startup, or did you was you able to somehow leverage the existing growth growth of Bitflyer? What, what I'm getting at is, was it like starting a brand new exchange from the ground up, or did you somehow was you able to use the momentum of Bitflyer to you know like I don't know bring some customers over, I don't know. 
That's that's what I'm asking. Was it like a standing start with zero customers and had to bootstrap it that way? It's kind of both. I mean, on one hand, it's a brand new company in the U.S. Um, you know, Bitflyer is is well known in Asia um, and in like um, uh, circles where uh, of traders. But the average person in the U.S. has not heard of Bitflyer. So in that mm -hmm. sense, we're starting at a very sort of um, you know seedling perspective. Right. On the flip side, it's not like a startup because we have our products have already been tested and used by you know millions of people in Japan. Um, you know the the key sort of thing is to like localize those products and to sort of make them feel and like uh, um, interact with users here in a way that they expect. But more or less, the, like the the DNA is already created. So in that sense, it's quite an advantage because we're not having to build a lot of the things from scratch. Um, sure. But we do have to acquire market share sort of from scratch in the same way that uh, any other startup would. Mm -hmm. What about like the, the technology infrastructure? Are, are people literally logging into the same website coming from the same servers? Or or are you having to expand it like to US hosting and stuff like that? Yeah, so uh, there is a separate site for Japan, a separate site for Europe, and a separate site for the U.S. Okay, gotcha. um, it's all it's all part of the Bitflyer domain. Uh, it's a, sort of like if you went to um, uh, I'm going to make this up, but like Sony.com right. uh, in the U.S., you'd get the U.S. version of Sony. If you went to Sony.com in Japan, you'd get the Japanese version. Right, but I suppose that's just a uh, an aesthetic difference, right? You're still mm -hmm. to do that thing we mentioned earlier on about. Um, combining all the liquidity, the the core, the back end bit is powered by the same engine or something, right? So you can link all the order books together and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. So we, we share common uh, sort of like a technology infrastructure. Okay, cool. So how do you, this has always fascinated me, how do you market a cryptocurrency exchange? Like how do you get people to use it, right? Because there's, to my mind, and I don't know enough about the industry, but there's uh, there's only so many ways I, I could think of to differentiate my exchange from the next one. So, um, and, and because the, it's kind of the, the network effect, it's that network externalities thing. Like everyone uses eBay because that's where all the buyers are, because that's where all the sellers are, because that's where all the buyers are sort of thing. And with any marketplace model, you have that, you need the buyers and the sellers to make the platform mm -hmm. work, right? So that was sort of harping back to my question about going from a standing start, well, it fascinated me how like Coben Hood started up because they literally started with nothing, right? No customers. And I'm like, how on earth did you go from nothing with no customers? Why would anyone start using it in the first place? Because no one's there, right? So can you give me some insight onto that? How do you, how do you, um, how do you like expand a cryptocurrency exchange and get people to use it? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. There's um, one who your target audience is right and in this case our lightning platform is uh, targeting more um, sort of professional users so targeting communities that um, these uh, professional traders frequent so we're doing um, like campaigns with some of the sites that provide tools for traders um, we're um, um, advertising through sort of channels that you know mm -hmm. people <laughs> when people search for uh, cryptocurrency uh, exchanges um, so there's a, there's an entire uh, sort of advertising uh, component to it, but frankly, like what makes this space interesting relative to other places like an eBay is that generally people are pretty satisfied with eBay. So if you if you were to try to start an eBay competitor, it's like, well, I already have eBay. But if you look at the cryptocurrency exchange space of 2018, um, there's still a lot of dissatisfaction among uh, users and that a lot of it came from growth that was really exponential in 2017. So um, people are a lot less loyal, frankly, I think to an exchange than they are to something like an eBay. So that's yeah. one. The second, the second piece is that um, people are looking for diversification when it comes to their uh, trading activities and, and frankly, like where they have any amount of cryptocurrency. So people are looking for diversification just for, for safety reasons. And frankly, like people in this space tend to want to try the new thing that's different and, and see how it compares. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that, that that's quite an advantage. And then, you know, particularly in our case, once we open up cross-border trading between the different regions, that's going to attract a very specific type of person who's looking to make very sort of large trades on, you know, uh, like a BTC JPY board that, that doesn't exist in the U.S. Um, or if they want to trade with Europe, um, that you know they could do that through us. 
So there's um, the market is actually a, a pretty ripe for new entrants, but then there's also some specific competitive advantages that we have that I don't think other people um, will have. Okay. Um, so, that, so, that, so that's one piece. And then you know the other thing that I think we've um, we've learned and, and we kind of expected is that the market of people who are professional traders is still small. Um, they, they do a lot of volume, but like the average person who knows how to place limit orders, how to place you know, special sort of change orders that our platform allows you to do um, is still sort of a, you know, a small percentage of, of people in the US. Um, but what a lot of people are looking for is how do I buy Bitcoin easily? How do I buy something like Ethereum uh, easily? And you know, uh, what we had publicly stated is that we're gonna launch this professional platform, but we're gonna move more into consumer this year. And so we're really excited about bringing a much easier interface for buying um, and selling cryptocurrencies that uh, doesn't have a huge learning curve. Which isn't exchange in the traditional sense of trading, a trading platform, but more a, a gateway from the fiat currency world, excuse me, into the crypto world. So more like a split between Coinbase and GDAX type of thing. GDAX being a trading platform and Coinbase being more of an on-ramp, as I would call it, which I think we need more of, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a simple way to um, get into cryptocurrencies that doesn't require a, like a ton of, um, you know, education prior. Um, and frankly, like the competition, I think, in this space is healthy for consumers in the community. Absolutely. We definitely need more, more of that. Absolutely. So I'm just looking at the, uh, the chat here. Someone says, what is Bitflyer? So do you want to, do you want to give us a, a quick one minute yeah. basic of what, what nerf is it? <laughs> Um, Bitflyer is one of the world's largest virtual currency exchanges and a blockchain research development company based out of Tokyo. Um, the company was started in 2014 and we launched the US at the end of 2017. And then we launched Europe in 2018. Great. And what coins do you currently support? I listed a couple earlier on, but is it mainly a Bitcoin exchange type thing? Yeah, so we launched our Lightning product with just um, Bitcoin as a starting point. And we're in the process of adding new currency pairs um, on the professional side. Um, and sort of the next big thing is going to be linking the order books together between us and Japan and, and uh, other markets. And then, uh, you know, as I just alluded to, the, there's some stuff on the horizon related to consumer products that will make it a lot more accessible for the average person to buy Bitcoin as well as other uh, currencies that, uh, that we're going to be listing. So that's a, a big growth area for you, not just attracting more traders, like you say, but getting that, um, I don't know what you call it. I call it gateway, the mm -hmm. the regular consumer piece, where if you just want to buy some Bitcoin, right, <laughs> and hold it, right, the, a, a way to do that. So that's um, something you've got to focus on developing more. Yeah, and, you know, it's, a, it's you know, most people, we, we sort of realize that start that way, right? Like you don't start in the, the Bitcoin or like a virtual currency space by, going on to a professional trading platform and starting to place limit orders, right? You, you first sort of buy a Bitcoin and then you start tracking the market, you you know, you know, sell it uh, or you buy some more and then you realize that there's actually tools that will let you do this in a lot more sophisticated way. And that's when you eventually sort of transition to these more professional exchanges. But it's a, you know, it's a, you need to make it really easy in the beginning and then a certain percentage of people will self-select into being very, very passionate, like active users. Right. They may become traders after the fact, like, yeah. So I'm going to pick out one of these questions here. Like, how do you, how do you as Bitflyer decide what coins to support? Because I, I just listed a few earlier on. Is, is this accurate? Um, when CoinMarketCap says you support Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash at the moment, those three. Um, in Japan, we do, as well as uh, Lisk, Mona, and uh, I don't remember all the things, the ones you just said. But um, in total, there are seven in Japan. Um, so the interesting thing about, um, you know, here, here are the factors that come into play. Um, we are, we think, one of the most regulated exchanges in the world because we have uh, regulation from Japan, regulation from Europe, and then regulation in the U.S. So for us to list coins um, is a process that kind of bifurcates into one question, which is simple, which is like, do we think that this coin has longevity? Do we think that users will be interested in it? Do we think that, you know, our consumers who buy it will be um, that it'll stick around. That's generally easier. Um, the, the harder part is making sure that it's compliant with all of our different um, uh, regulatory bodies. And um, that is a, it's a much longer process. So for example, in the US, um, we are uh, licensed in 43 uh, states. And 
uh, some states have their own approval processes for certain coins. Um, there's certain coins that are, uh, frankly, um, easier, and there's certain coins that are harder. Um, so it, it, there's a state by state component. There's also like the government body. So the SEC has recently come in and, and had some viewpoints on what they think are are securities versus not securities. So you know we have to basically go through a process to make sure that all of those boxes are checked before we feel comfortable um, listing new coins on the, the platform. It, it sounds like the U the U.S. is a bit of a nightmare though. So why why didn't Bitfly decide to expand in from Japan like in Asia? Why why come all the way over to the U.S., which sounds like a royal nightmare to me from a regulatory <laughs> standpoint? Well, it's a big market, right? Um, yeah. There's a, a lot of people here. Um, there is relatively little competition, much like you know every every this industry is quite new, and you know the vision has always been to be a global company, and so to be a global company but not operate in the U.S. quite difficult to, to sort of execute on that vision. Sure. And you know the biggest problem is right now the U.S. market can't access the uh, Japanese market, which is the largest Bitcoin market in the world. Something like fifty mm -hmm. percent of all Bitcoin trading exists in Japan. It reminds me of that thing when there was all that volume from Korea and then when the Korean regulators cracked down on those the virtual bank accounts where a foreigner could create a virtual bank account and then use that to deposit funds into the Korean cryptocurrency exchanges and so on. And that's where a lot of, well, it wasn't Korean volume though, it was, it was sort of international money that was going mm -hmm. through these virtual bank accounts and then get into the exchanges that way. And when they, and they cut that off, that caused a, a bit of a dip in the old Bitcoin prices. The model you're talking about, though, where you're linking together the three fiat currency pairs that trade against Bitcoin is almost an evolved way of doing that, right? Um, so that's that's a good thing, I think, for the, for the space as a whole. Yeah, I mean, you're still following all of the local rules for um, the compliance rules of, of, of trading sort of like a bank in to, to, mm -hmm. to Bitcoin. Um, sure. And then the actual exchange happens within a board that you can get into by transferring Bitcoin in. So, you know, our goal has always been to allow everyone to have access to Bitcoin and trade um, amongst each other. Sure, sure. So let's let's go to that question. The, the, the one I said that was, it was asked like, I don't know, 50 people have asked the same question. I'm not sure if this is a, a conspiracy, but it's, the question is, are you going to add Digibyte to the platform? Right, seriously, there was about 50 or 60 people all with different email addresses and different names that basically ask the same question. Will you list Digibyte on the exchange? Yeah. I have no idea why that coin uh, has come up specifically to do with the Bitflyer interview. And I wondered if you had any clue as to why somehow, as soon as someone from Bitflyer came on the show that suddenly Digibyte came up. I have no idea. Yeah, um, not sure, but uh, you know, our company policy is we can't comment publicly about coins that we may or may not list. That's that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I mean, there's 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 so many questions about that. Um, they someone asks like, does it make a difference how centralized or decentralized the coin is? Like Ripple, for example, would would the would Ripple put you off because it's more centralized? Is that one of the criteria that you have to use when looking at a, you know to support a particular crypto? So what I'll, I'll kind of go back to what I shared earlier is um, a lot of it comes down to what's the regulatory sort of viewpoint of something like that. And mm -hmm. so that's the lens that we would take as well as the consumer benefit we think we have, the customer has. Sure. And you mentioned earlier on, you said like, uh, you, you used the phrase Bitflare's competitive advantages. So can you, can you, I know we've probably covered these, but in, a, in its own segment, if I asked you what are Bitflare's sort of competitive advantages, what would you say? Yeah, so we're a global marketplace for buying and selling virtual currencies. And uh, that allows us to um, cater to professional traders in a way that no other um, market can. We're the largest in the world. Um, something like 30% of all Bitcoin trading happens through Bitflyer today. And we also think that we're the most regulated exchange. So we have one of the first licenses in Japan um, we have 43 licenses in uh, the USA, including New York Bit license, which is very difficult to get. And then we're licensed in uh, by the European Union. Um, mm. And you know, another key area for us that we're that, that I'm quite passionate about is customer support. So you know, the U.S. market has uh, grown a lot in 2017, and a lot of people had bad experiences in other places. 
And uh, one of the things that we're really investing in is just a fantastic customer experience in the US. Sure. And what's that going to look like there? So I think people's frustration tends to be when they don't get responses for a long time, when there are um, like unaddressed issues, when they're stuck in um, an onboarding process. Um, you know, all of those problems are things that I'm really aware of here in the US and we're working really hard to keep those times really reasonable. Generally, my feel on that is what the thing that takes the time is the ID verification stuff. If there's a massive yeah. backlog of that, because it's reasonably time consuming. Is that just simply a case of manpower? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of ways you can uh, attack it, right? There's technologies you can use. There's also a human component. Sure. And didn't, I'm thinking back to a few news stories that I've covered about Bitflyer over the last maybe year or so. Do you have or any plans to get a, a point of sale component? Because I seem to remember some news stories, and this is going back months, months and months, but it was something like Bitflyer helps, I don't know, like car garage accept Bitcoin as payment or something. So is there a mm -hmm. point of sale piece in there? In, in Bitflyer? Yeah, so Bitflyer in Japan has a product um, called Pay that you can use to um, receive or send payments to people through our network. Right. And um, some retailers like Big Camera have adopted that and you can buy things through Big Camera with Bitcoin. Um, gotcha. Although currently that's uh, that's in Japan. And then in that way, you kind of act like BitPay in the sense that if I'm a Japanese retailer and I want to receive the Japanese yen, but have the customer pay in Bitcoin, you can facilitate that exchange in the middle, right? Kind of like it. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, similar. It's a kind of works like um, what did I say? BitPay, for example. Yeah. All right. So someone asks, "What is your business plan for your office in Luxembourg? Do you have an office in Luxembourg?" We do. Yeah. Is that so the that's the office, right? that's the European office that I mentioned. That we launched in uh, in January. Sorry, what, what was the question? What does the business plan look like? What is your business plan for your office in Luxembourg? So what yeah, is new? I, go on, go for it. I think it's a, a pretty similar mission to the US, which has become a dominant exchange in, in Europe. And using the same principles, yeah. Is that mm -hmm. is that the, the global order book? Is that really your crown jewel, would you say? I think that that's one of our uh, you know crown jewels. Um, you know, the other thing that I argue is that um, when you start making it really easy to buy virtual currencies in a non-professional platform um, that the average consumer can, can, uh, can touch, which is what um, Japan also has, I think that's going to be really powerful. Sure. You know, you know, someone goes um, who's just a regular consumer and they just want to you know, buy some crypto for the first time, but don't want to like, trade it. I've always wondered if that order goes through to the market or if that's a part of Bitcoin that the exchange owns and is selling to the consumer. Are you following what I'm saying here? So say I go on to the exchange and then do a buy with my credit card, right? They quotes me, this is the rate you're going to get for your for your US dollars or whatever. Is it pulling that from the order book on the exchange or is that a separate system? I've always wondered that. Mm, yeah. So like, where do you actually source that from? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, that that's frankly kind of, uh, um, up to the exchange and you know there, there's a lot of ways to sort of make it possible um but certainly exchanges is one place where you can source the inventory for that kind of a, a sale okay. um sure. but you know you can also have that inventory sort of in stock for example right so it doesn't yeah, necessarily yeah. mean that you always have that uh that you're always just fetching it directly from an exchange exactly. so it, it's a it, it ends up being a sort of an inventory management and sort of a sourcing question mm -hmm. sure this one asks what are the like the fees for buying and selling crypto on bitflyer yeah, so um, we currently don't charge a fee, which is great. So um, if you sign up for Bitflyer USA or Bitflyer Europe, um, the trades are fee free for a limited time. Is that uh, a little bait to attract customers in the first instance, right? That, that might have been a plug. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure but you are going to introduce fees later down the line, right? I suppose. We are, you, yeah. Do you charge your withdrawal fees as well, I assume? There's a um a ten dollar withdrawal fee for wires um mostly because that's what we get charged so we have right. to pass that cost on what about if i withdraw some crypto uh the only fee that you would pay is the um um uh transaction fee like the, the bitcoin um oh really you don't charge a, a, a official withdrawal fee if i if i withdraw the, the bitcoin 
Because that's something that a lot of mainstream exchanges do. Uh, I mean, the fee that you pay is like the minor fee, effectively, or the estimated minor fee. Okay. Well, that's different. Because a lot of the other exchanges that I use, you, you pay that and like a withdrawal fee, which is... No, uh, no I mean, it's your money. Interesting. You should have uh, you know the ability to, to use it. Sure. Okay, I don't understand what that question is, so I'll skip that one. Um, <laughs> someone asked, what's the next big thing after Bitcoins? Proof of work or proof of stake? I don't know if that's a question for for you as a sort of a running an exchange. Um, someone says, what do you think about the notion of traditional securities becoming tokenized? Are you seeking to list or support any of these types of things? Traditional securities being tokenized. The tough part there is it's, well, one, there'd just be a lot of regulatory work and securities in some ways are already tokenized, right? Like they're, they're traded assets that you can move back and forth. They're just not crypto assets. True. Um, so, you know, I think what you, you typically hear about more is like things that aren't, uh, securities getting tokenized. Um, and then there's the question of those, do those become securities or utility tokens or, you know, on what exchange can they sort of operate in the U S. Um, but I suppose that if you wanted to tokenize, um, uh, existing sort of like equities markets, it would just be a, a lot of regulatory work with, I'm not sure what the benefit would be. Mm. So you made a point there, like they're kind of tokenized in the sense that there's an abstraction in like a piece of paper that represents it. I think people are talking more about, you know, blockchain based token coins that can float around that represent, you know, a traditional security or something like that. So I suppose the main benefit of tokenizing it in a cryptocurrency is just the friction and the ease of movement and the security and all that kind of stuff, I suppose. I know. Yeah, that's true. It could be it could be easier to move. Um, and I think within equities, you, um, you know, the, the, the one interesting difference between crypto markets and sort of equities markets is that in equity markets, you always have to sell for like in the US, for example, US dollars. If I wanted to buy, a, if I had a share of Apple, I wanted to buy a share of Tesla, I'd have to sell my Apple share, get US dollars, use that US dollars, then buy a Tesla stock, right? Mm -hmm. So it's in uh, the crypto space, you can actually do currency, currency pairs. Like theoretically, there would be a Tesla, you know, denominated by Apple currency pair that you could trade sure. in and out of. You could. Yeah, if someone was creating a market and there was, you could do a buy and yeah. sell for course that you could. How many, how many Apple shares for a Tesla share sort of thing? Yeah. Everything so in different. Japan, we have, we have an Ethereum BTC board, so you can trade back and forth Ethereum relative to Bitcoin. You use the word board. What do you mean by that? Because I, I wouldn't. Yeah, so it's a, I guess it's the term for um, describing sort of the, uh, the activity, right? And, and, and the, the trading activity within that currency pair. So um, on that board, you have, let's say, Bitcoin and US dollars. And the only thing you can do is trade Bitcoin and US dollars amongst each other. And there's all these tools that we provide that can, can um, you can create sort of complicated strategies. But at the end of the day, you're just, um, uh, operating within those two currencies. It's just an order book, right? For a certain um, currency pair. Okay. And we call that a board. Okay, I think I would, I, I think I would call that, I'd use the word market, but you you, yeah. call, you say board specifically to mean that, that thing. That but, but, that, but that board only contains um, one product, if you think about it like that, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Bitcoin that you can buy with US dollars or you can sell Bitcoin for US dollars, but a board doesn't contain like multiple currencies. I got you. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So someone asks, do you provide people with a, a 1099 form? I have no idea what that is. I'm sure I'm assuming that's some kind of IRS tax form or something like that. You know what a 1099 is? Yeah. Um, so I think he's referring to a tax question. Uh, we don't provide a 1099 form, but what we provide is a transaction history that you can download and um, your taxes based off of um, all the transactions that have um, that you know that you've taken place in your tax year. Okay, I think I see what they mean when they've done their trading and need to report that because in America it's rather complicated to do. Um, it is now anyway. Yep. So someone asks, what uh, what kind of policies do you have in place to protect customers like privacy, security, that kind of thing? Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
we take uh, security very seriously, um, as any virtual currency exchange should. Um, one thing that we offer is two-factor authentication, and that's something that we highly encourage our members to use. Um, we have a cold wallet where the majority of sort of global assets are stored. Um, we uh, um, uh, force sort of like uh, re-login um, upon certain suspicious activities. Like so, the, the, and there, there's a lot more sort of we do from a um, security perspective that I can't really share just given the nature of sort of the detection. But the, I think the key point is that um, security is obviously something in our space that is uh, incredibly important because of what, what's happened in the past with other exchanges. Um, and uh, also I think uh, it's worth noting that uh, we are insured in Japan. So uh, customer assets are protected. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I'm just looking at the BitFly site here. It actually says, are you a resident of Europe? please see our website for European-based customers. So that's what you were talking about earlier on with regards to yep. flipping the different interfaces. Um, what was clever is the um, the section that says like what media outlets you've been featured in, it changes to, uh, I don't know if that's intentional, but it changes to be more yeah. appropriate to the audience. That's kind of clever. That's kind of clever, I like that. Sweet. So let's bring myself back here. So I've flicked through all the questions in the chat and that were submitted beforehand. Oh, here's another one. Is it possible to pull all the crypto bought on an exchange? So I think what they mean is, if someone wanted to wanted to withdraw all the crypto that they had stored on Bitfly, can they do it? I think where this is coming from is there's been a lot of fear spread around recently about, well, the exchanges are basically doing fractional reserve banking. That's that's what people are um, starting to suspect. That you know, if X exchange says they have this much crypto they only really have 70 percent of that and if if there was a bank run effectively they wouldn't have all the crypto there so um the question is yeah, so, 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 yeah i'll answer that so you, we're not a fractional reserve, reserve service yeah. uh, so no um you can withdraw all of your coins um at any time we can't use your customer funds and um you know like i said before we're highly regulated um so um there's uh, uh no concerns you can withdraw it so it's, it's a full reserve, right? That's basically what they yeah. want to know. So that's good. You also said that it's insured in Japan. Is that like the deposit insurance thing in case of, you know, insolvency, the consumer's funds are protected type of thing? No, it's actually uh, related to cyber theft. So um, uh, if in the event that Bitflyer um, you know, experiences some kind of like a security event and your funds are lost, um, there's a certain amount of coverage that consumers have. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm impressed that an insurance company would, would take that on, given that you know cryptocurrency is so new and it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big target for, for the attackers, right? But uh, mm -hmm. sweet. So that's, uh, that's reassurance that I'm sure that doesn't lead you to be slack in any way in terms of security. That's just an extra thing. You know, yeah. if, some, if some Black Swan event happened, even then, the consumer's funds are still insured against that cyber yeah. theft angle. Yeah, and obviously that's the last thing we ever want, but it gives some peace of mind. Right. But that's that's no excuse for not having the insurance just in case. Right. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. So that's pretty much all the questions I've got. Is there anything else you wanted to make sure that we covered? Something you want to make sure that the audience knows about Bitflyer before we close up? Yeah, I think what I'm, uh, you know, just want to share is um, one, please try us out. Uh, we're new in the US and, um, you know, we're really focusing on trying to provide the best experience that um, that is available in the space. Um, and then, you know, stay tuned for, you know, news coming from us uh, more on the consumer front. Cool. So if people want to stay tuned, where's the best way to follow you guys, get in touch with you? You've got an email list, that kind of stuff. Uh, honestly, uh, just sign up for the page and we're going to keep you very much informed of all of our new uh, products. So, so just go to bitflyer.com slash ENUS. Okay. It also says here you can sign up for a corporate account as well, if you want one. That's right. That's kind of yeah. So we support both corporate and uh, individual traders. Excellent. Well, that's cool then. Oh, there's one more question here. Um, how do you prioritize your orders? Is it instant? I don't really know what that means. Is, I suppose that's a first in, first out type of system. I'm not sure I... I'm not yeah, sure I what think, the question is. Yeah. Don't worry about that, that's fine. Okay. So uh, for now, Bartex, thanks very much for being on the Cryptoverse. Thanks so much. Appreciate the time and great talking to you. 
All right, guys, if you like this episode, hit the like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Leave us a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. So until next time, it's me and Bartex saying bye for now. Bye.